Hi, it's Robert Mitchell of the 2014 Toronto International Film Festival. We're here at Midnight Madness for the international premiere of Mark Hartley's latest documentary, Electric Boogaloo, The Wild Untold Story of Canon Films. So for the Midnight Madness blog, Robert Mitchell and Sarah. Hi. Hi, welcome back to Midnight Madness. Thank you very much. I was wondering, uh, that first uh, screening of Not Quite Hollywood that played here in 2008, how did that change your life and your career? It made me have an excuse to get up every morning and make another film. Um, that's the thing, you know, you play to audiences like Midnight Madness and it just makes you want to keep making films so you can bring them back here. So it's great. I was, you know, thankful, luckily being invited back from Machete Maidens and now we're back in Midnight Madness with this film. So that's incredible. And I was wondering, um, so now looking back on it, you did Not Quite Hollywood, uh, Machete Maidens, and now this film. Did you set out to make a trilogy of documentaries or did that just kind of evolve? Uh, look, after, the, after Machete Maidens, I wanted to do narrative films, which I managed to do in last year. But people, after these screenings, kept on hounding me to make one more. So in a way, this film was made, the audience is responsible for this film being made. So yeah, it was. Um, it's a nice way to cap off a somewhat strange documentary career. Hello, I'm Richard Kraft. I'm Robin Sherwood. And uh, you were in uh, Death Wish. She was Death Wish too, and I was head of music at Canon on many of their most spectacular productions. I was wondering, uh, we recently lost Mr. Golan. What are some of your fond memories of working with him? I, I actually met him in the very beginning of my career, and when I met him, he had Canon Films was actually a uh, curtain and a studio in the Cannes Film Festival, so I really feel I met him from the very beginning, so I feel sort of a, a loss. I, I found, I, you know, he was, he was a sweet man. He was incredibly bigger than life, insane, completely oblivious. Everyone in life should have their Menachem, because I don't even know how to live life without someone that proudly out of touch with any form of reality but doing it so robustly and this movie is a tribute to what it takes when you have no talent but lots of balls and that man had crazy balls and it's a celebration of just a guy who is oblivious to all the no-sayers in the world and if he only had any taste man what that guy would have made and, um your films are so densely layered with interviews and archival footage and that. Can you talk a bit about the, how long it took to put all this together for the Canon film and the editing process? Sure. Uh, look, this was pretty quick, actually. We, we only shot the last interviews in June, so here we are, not June, maybe May we shot them. So, yeah, it was a, it was a tough job cutting 120 hours of interviews and a similar amount of film footage down, but I think it's a pretty tight 107 minutes of non-stop money shots. And you have uh, animation in this one also? A yeah, bit. it's pretty much, look, it's the same, it's the same, if it ain't broke, you don't need to fix it. It's, oh, it's, your films have so much energy, you know, and... Well, look, it's also, it's also the same team behind it, the same animator, same, you know, same editors. So, um, it was, we can do it in our sleep. I was wondering, uh, you worked in Death Wish too, what was it like to work with uh, Charles Bronson? Well, Charles Bronson actually was a very, very good actor, and he was really wonderful to work with because what I gave him, he gave back to me. So I really learned the art of really listening, and working with him, not only that, he was like an amazing person in real life. He walked around with his children in a van, things that were not even chic then, I just and that was, I think, his release. So I learned that there's the screen person and then there's the person person and they can be both and they can be equally as great. Looking back at this giant filmography of all these films, what are some of your favorite films from the, their um, filmography? Wow, that's difficult. <laughs> you know, some are so spectacularly horrible and some were just boringly horrible so it's hard to compare I I have a personal warm spot for a movie Sahara with Brooke Shields that was the Lawrence of Arabia of horrible movies but it, it was so sincere in its awfulness that it, it's kind of special my favorite is Runaway Train I saw that when I was a kid I love that well yeah, unfortunately Runaway Train actually is a good movie yeah. so it doesn't quite <laughs> fit in the canon of canon films <laughs> it's like the asterisk it's like Oh, we accidentally made a good movie, yeah, yeah. but it's no Masters of the Universe. <laughs> well, it's very nice meeting you guys, and um, have fun tonight at the premiere. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, I was wondering, so you started revisiting all these Canon films. Uh, is there some gems that you saw or what are some of your favorite Canon films? Yeah, there are. I mean, look, I was, I'd was i forgotten how great The Last American Virgin is. For me, my discovery of a Canon films was Life Force. And for me, that film hasn't been topped in just its amount of sheer insanity on screen with such a gigantic budget behind it. So for me, that's the reason to get down on your hands and knees and thank Canon every day that of your lifetime because without them we wouldn't have life force my first uh one i ever saw as a kid was um um invasion usa and then my favorite is runaway train and i think they're ama that's an amazing film it is look i mean you've just got to see uh, you know unstoppable to realize that the legacy of runaway train still very much in hollywood yeah i was wondering uh so you had all these interview subjects in the film some of the films are better than others uh were any of them reluctant to talk about some of the older films oh look i think i think because you know i've been lucky with my documentaries that they've they've, they've tackled subjects that haven't really been tackled before so these people are getting their first opportunity really to tell these tales i think there's a novelty to that and um also these people got their start at canon so i think there's also a bit of nostalgia involved as well and people tend to forget how the bad times remember the good times